Hello and welcome to our Bible study for Zion Lutheran Church. I'm Pastor Cottrell. Uh, and today we're in the book of Revelation. We're in chapter 19. We finished uh, chapter 18 last time and we had this image of Babylon, this very poetic description of Babylon, which represented sort of the, the city of evil, the, the city of corruption, the city of betrayal. Uh, against God uh, being consumed in judgment and the smoke rising from it, uh, almost like an, an offering of incense. It was it was kind of eerie. Uh, and so we finished that, and now we're moving on to chapter 19. And so after all these chapters where it feels like we've only had judgment, we're going to have a little bit of a break, a little bit of a nice window, some sunlight coming in, uh, and we're going to see the rejoicing that is in heaven. And so we'll begin uh, in chapter 19, verse 1. But before we do that, let's open with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, as we open up the book of Revelation today, we pray for the light of your spirit and your truth, so that as we see our Savior Jesus Christ, we would be comforted in the gospel and we would be reassured of your love. Uh, all these things we pray and ask in Christ's name. Amen. Verse 1. After this, I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for his judgments are true and just, for he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Once more they cried out, Hallelujah! The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. Uh, we'll pause there. So first of all, there is uh, there is the terror in Babylon, but there is the rejoicing of the saints that there is finally justice, that there is finally uh, judgment for the many sins that uh, Babylon has committed against uh, Christians, against believers, against the martyrs that they killed. Uh, and so there is worship, there is hallelujah, there is uh, sounds of praise, and it is declaring again whose victory is it? It is God's victory. So it's the, the idea is that God wins, that he, uh, though it seems like for a while on earth that uh, that Satan rules or that evil win, prevails, um, the, the, the conclusion of history is God's victory. And so that's the comfort of the saints. That's why they cry, hallelujah. Uh, and, and again, glory and power belong to our God. These are two uh, interesting words, uh, glory and power. Glory uh, really means it's it's dox, it's praise. It's the type of exalting that you have where you just shout out loud because you just can't believe how how marvelous uh, it is. And so, and it, it's it's glory that you ascribe uh, to God. So it's not flattery. I think sometimes when we think of praise uh, or glorifying God. Uh, we sometimes have the wrong human notion where we think, well, that means making something better than it is, right? So uh, glorying means like you have something that's not that great or, or it's okay or it's even good. And then you praise it and you're like, oh, this is the best one ever. This is marvelous. Uh, and so you're actually inflating it. Uh, but when we glorify God, one theologian has rightly pointed out, we can only at best try to magnify God. So God actually is glorious. He actually is great. He actually is praiseworthy. And so when we glorify God, we're really magnifying, like a magnifying glass, uh, showing us more clearly uh, what who God is uh, and why he is praiseworthy. Uh, and so glory to God. Uh, they cry. Uh, and then also power belongs to God. And power, again, it's a, a word that, oh man, especially in academia, power is always seen as corrupting, right? Or, or power is kind of evil. It's always the, the sort of boot on the neck of, of someone else, right? And that's that's how we understand power. Uh, but I think the, the, the Latin word helps us a bit, potentia, um, it shows us, you know, if God is omnipotentia, it means that e everything is possible for him. So power really is linked to that word possible, potential. So every potentiality, uh, every way of, of doing something is, is open to God. Uh, and so I think it's, it's remarkable if you think of the fact that uh, God is omnipotent, he can make 
away in any way. He, he there, there's every possibility for him. He is not hampered. He is not uh, railroaded into any uh, set path. But he actually has the potentiality to do all of these different things. And so that's uh, that shows God's freedom and his his power, his ability. Uh, and I think it's a little better than just our human notion of power, which tends to be kind of a club coming down. Uh, and it, it shows God's freedom and his 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 ability. Uh, his judgments are true and just. I think that's another really important thing. Oftentimes uh, in life, you don't care how you win as long as you win, right? It's the idea is like, well, our team won. And it doesn't really matter if the umpire made the right call or not. It just matters that we won. And I think the remarkable thing is that uh, the saints cry out in the end when they see God's victory. Uh, they say God is true. Uh, what, what he says and does corresponds to reality. He's not deceiving us. He's not lying to us. Uh, none of that. Uh, and then it's just, it's fair. And so I think a lot of times we uh, struggle when we read these portions of the Bible uh, to, to say, well, is it really fair? And I mean, constantly in Bible study, when we would teach uh, different things like the conquest of Israel, you always get questions from people and they're heartfelt questions of, is it really fair? You know, was, was Babylon really that bad that they had to have this? And I think our comfort in the scriptures is that when that day comes, when we see judgment, we will not have the reaction of, that was a little harsh, God. No, we will see everything the way that it really is and we will proclaim that God's work is just, that it is fair, uh, that there is uh, given to everyone what ought to be given. And so that might be hard for us now. And I think at times we have to tell ourselves, I don't understand it now. I can't see that as just now, but I trust in God. I trust that he knows more than I do. And on that last day, when he reveals it, I will declare that it is just. Um, so the, the great prostitute again is condemned. We talked about that last time. Uh, blood is avenged. Uh, they cried out, hallelujah, for the smoke from her goes up forever and ever. Now, this is interesting. Uh, this chapter has a lot of worship imagery for us. Uh, and so it's important that we look at, at this image here of smoke going up. Now, if you read in the Old Testament, in the books of Leviticus and Deuteronomy, and it talks about the offerings that people would make, they would put, you know, uh, these animals that had been slain on the altar, and, or they would burn them. And it talks about the offering around rising to God and it's a sweet savor, it's a sweet aroma uh, to God. And so there's this notion of uh, sacrifice, there's this notion of the smoke rising to God. And I think it's a picture for us of uh, the things that we are given in life, the things that we are blessed with, the materials, the opportunity, the strength that we have today when we woke up, everything that we have been given by God uh, can be spent in a way of honoring him, in a way of pleasing him, in a way of carrying out our callings and what we're uh, we're, we're given to do. Uh, and in that sense, we are offering a sacrifice of praise. We are offering it up as, as a savor that is pleasing to the Lord, uh, not because we're so good, but because Christ is doing this in us. Because when we are joined to Christ by faith and he works this in us, then it is pleasing to God. So we can sort of take the material that we have and offer it up to God and sacrifice in what we, we'd say and do. Uh, or... We can have it kind of hoarded to ourselves. We can use it for sin. We can use it. Uh, we can use the stuff God gives us to make really bad decisions. We can use the power God gives us to hurt or abuse others or, or just uh, make everyone focus on us uh, to the exclusion of what God uh, has given them to do. Uh, and when we do that, we're basically hoarding sin for judgment. Uh, and so I think the kind of image here with Babylon is like, you can either offer up what you have in sacrifice to God, in, in Christian sacrifice, uh, and the smoke is pleasing to him, or you can wait until the last day when it's all going to get consumed by fire anyway, and the smoke of its destruction will be a pleasing sacrifice uh, to God. And so it's kind of that, that duality. It's like, do you want to offer it up as praise now, or do you want to wait for it to be burned up, right? It's not going to it's not going to be of any value then. Uh, and so the only thing that's uh, that's of value really is 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 what's given to God. Um, verse four, and the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who was seated on the throne saying, Amen, Alleluia. 
a hallelujah, and from the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, small and great. Uh, so again, it's this, this call to praise God, and it's not the uh, that God has an ego problem and he wants us to praise him, but it's when we see God, uh, we will give praise, we will rejoice, we will exult, we'll actually enjoy the process of worship. It's not something that will be wrung out of us. Uh, it's something that we will actually joy and delight in giving. Uh, the marriage feast, uh, it might say something like the marriage feast of the, the marriage supper in your text. Uh, and we'll read this passage, uh, verses 6 to uh, 10 here. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory. For the marriage feast of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the, linen, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true words of God. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, You must not do that. I am a, a fellow servant with you, and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus worship him. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. All right, so we get this invitation to the marriage feast of God. And, and this, is, uh, this brings out a lot of the words that we use in our liturgy when we talk about communion. Uh, we often talk about it. You know, I think there's that old uh, communion entrance uh, uh, welcome, which is, you know, uh, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb or the marriage feast of the Lamb. In his kingdom, uh, and so again, uh, the question from from the opponents of well, why do you use this liturgy? Because it's the Bible. It's what the Bible teaches us uh, for worshiping God. It's the example that the Bible gives us uh, for praising God. And so we use these words and we use these uh, images in in our praise. And so. This is uh, this is the image here of of a marriage feast, right? You have the image of uh, celebration. You have the image of uh, partying, right? Because at, at a wedding, you know, it doesn't matter what generation you're from. It doesn't matter uh, what era you're celebrating a wedding. You know, if you're in ancient Greece or you're in uh, modern day Canada, the the, se the sense is still one of celebration of joy. Uh, and I think that's good. I, I think it's uh, sometimes when you talk about the heavenly image of worship, people are like, oh, church service forever. That that doesn't sound too pleasing. Um, but I think that the celebration of a wedding kind of reassures us uh, that, oh, that actually, you know, even if we're not too sanctified uh, here and now, I think it, it will be uh, a pleasing image for us one day. And and the image of, of the wedding feast is more easily and readily available for us of, oh, I can see how that's uh, celebration. I can see how that's uh, joyful forever. And so we see this, this liturgy of, of marriage uh, and celebration, this hallelujah, this rejoicing, this praising, uh, the marriage of Christ and his bride. Uh, one of my teachers once said to me, uh, one day every man will be wearing a wedding dress in Christ and uh, you have to make peace with that. And I don't, I, I think he was being a little uh, humorous here, but the idea is that the church is the bride of Christ. So our part in this picture, in this wedding, uh, is to be the bride. Uh, and I don't know what, what uh, the marriage feast has to hold exactly, uh, but if it's anything like a, a marriage in Canada nowadays, it really is the bride's day. Uh, so turns out pretty good for us. Um, so it's uh, we are we are clothed, we are are there in fine linen, pure and bright, uh, and we are there before Christ. Now, this is another problem uh, because when you look at the church today as it exists, uh, unless you have a, a, a really wonderful, optimistic. Uh, perspective, you probably won't say, well, the church is pure and bright and, and clean. Uh, you know, it's like fine linen when I look at the church. Uh, you might look at the church and say, well, you know, it's it's kind of held together by this ragtag bunch of volunteers and these pastors who are, some of them are okay and some of them are, are good and, and some of them are, are kind of crummy. Uh, and so when you look at the church, you might think, oh, you know, I think of church politics and squabbles and fights. Like, 
that's not pure and holy. And, and so I think the promise for us is that in heaven, we will be pure. We will be holy. God will have finished his work in sanctification. He will have finished making us holy and pure. And so we have this beautiful image of the church here. And we're invited to the supper. And so this, of course, is sacramental language. Uh, this is the language of the Lord's Supper, right? So we have the Lord's Supper, which was intro which was instituted by Christ uh, during the Passover. So if we look all the way back to the Passover, we see that as, as relevant to our discussion of the sacrament. And then we also have the chief institution of Christ uh, in the, the Lord's Supper as being relevant. Uh, and then we have the final uh, celebration of the wedding feast in heaven. Uh, and so all of these points are relevant for the Lord's Supper. And so the Lord's Supper leads us uh, through God's story of salvation to that final joy, to that final moment when we will be eating and, and being refreshed with God in heaven. And so that is the that is the destination, as it were, of the Lord's Supper. So when we are taking the Lord's Supper, when we are receiving uh, the bread and wine, which are the, the true body and blood of Christ for us in the sacrament, uh, we are being drawn to that moment when we, as, as the body of Christ, will be with Christ in heaven. We will be communing with, with Christ directly and visibly. We'll be sharing uh, in his presence and in his conversation and in his comforts. Uh, and so that is the, the final moment that it kind of points to. Uh, and so we like to use this imagery of the Lord's Supper in the Lutheran Church of both sides of the altar. So we think of those of us participating now in the Lord's Supper are eating at the same table that extends all the way into heaven, where these people in Revelation 19 are celebrating the, the feast uh, of, of Christ's kingdom in heaven. Uh, and so we're all at the same table. We just can't see past uh, the altar. We just can't see past the other side of the veil of death. All right, I have to finish the rest of the chapter, uh, so I need to, to move on quickly here. Uh, I, oh, I need to mention this one thing. Uh, constantly, when we read the book of Revelation, there is this terror when we read of the judgments of, I'm not good enough. I'm not going to get in. I'm worried. Uh, and look at John here. John is here in Revelation 19, and he falls down uh, to worship the angel. He still gets the first commandment wrong. He's breaking the first commandment in his vision of heaven. Uh, and how does the angel treat him? I think the angel treats him pretty gently. The angel just says, you must not do that. Uh, and brings him up and reminds him, you know, worship Jesus. And so I think this is an image where we see Babylon. Uh, they are condemned in sin. They are, are burned uh, and their smoke rises forever. But what about John? He gets off easy because he is a Christian. He is in Christ. He has made uh, a, a mistake, but he's also sinned. And he has been called back up. He's been lifted up again and sent on the right path. And I think this should be comforting for us that even John the disciple is making these huge mistakes. And he still has God's grace. He still has his forgiveness, even in this, this vision here. So I take, I take comfort in that, that it's, you know, we are not perfect as Christians. Uh, and we need not fear that the first time we make a mistake, God is going to just whack us uh, uh, with a hammer or something. <clears throat> All right, let's uh, finish this chapter. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, the one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty." On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and with a loud voice he called to all the birds that fly directly overhead, Come gather for the great supper of God, to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and their riders, and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both great, small and great, 
And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him, who was sitting on the horse and against his army. And the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet, who in its presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur, and the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse, and all the birds were gorged with their flesh. Oh boy. Uh, so we get this dual image. So we get the the supper of heaven. You know, blessed are those who are called uh, to the supper of God. And we think of the Lord's Supper. We think of the banquet of heaven that Jesus talks about so frequently uh, in the parables of the Gospels. And now we get this awful version of, of a supper. So we have like the Lord's Supper. We have the celebration of heaven. And then we have the supper uh, that will be, you know, the crows eating the flesh of, of the dead who are, are struck down by the wrath of of God as Jesus leads the armies of heaven against the enemies of God. And so we have this duality. We have this, this two part image uh, where we have the Lord's supper and then we have this final supper of judgment. Uh, and so it's a, uh, it's a very gruesome image here for us. Um, and again, because we are sinners, we always feel sorry for the sinners uh, because we ourselves uh, remain sinners, even as we're Christians uh, who are saved by grace. And so we have that dual identity of sinner saints. Uh, but the sinner in us hears this and is like, this is not a, a happy image for me. Uh, but again, we think of the injustice, we think of the suffering, we think of all the things that man has uh, wrought and done to man and evil, and how there needs to be a judgment, there needs to be a, a, a formal closing of the cases, as it were, uh, for there to be true peace. And so we have this uh, glorious image of Jesus, this image of Jesus that, uh, you know, he is strong, he is king of kings, he is lord of lords, he is the almighty, and he will one day ride into battle uh, and, and strike down the enemies of his people. And so uh, at the end of the day, you are either gathered at the Lord's table, you are either gathered for uh, the Lord's Supper, for communion with, with Christ, or you are gathered against him and you will be feasted on. So you either feast with God in heaven or you will be feasted on, as it were. Uh, by the crows and you will face judgment. Uh, I'm not going to get yet into the, the lake of fire stuff uh, because that comes up a lot more in the, pro, uh, in the following chapters. Uh, so we'll discuss that then. Uh, but I, I think we should close with this, this word of comfort that uh, though we, were, we are sinners, we are offered forgiveness. We are offered a place at God's table. Those words were said to you today. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Uh, and so you are invited to a seat at the table of God. You are invited to have fellowship with him. Uh, and so our word of comfort is come and draw near to Christ now. Uh, at the proper time, uh, and, and share in his celebration and his joy. God's blessings.